So hi everybody, uh, my name is Vlad. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for the well, warm welcome. Um, I spent many years living in Haifa. I did my military service here in the Navy base not far from here. Then I did my uh, bachelor degree studies here. So this city is very special for me. Uh, I'm living today in Natania, in Fariona. Um, in the last four years I'm working at Outbrain. And in the last three years I'm uh, working as a, a team lead, developing tools for our publishers at Outbrain. And today I came to talk to you about a framework called NestJS. Anybody heard about this uh, framework? Yay. Yay! So great. So we will learn new stuff. Uh, if we take these three frameworks comparing to uh, NestJS, they're totally different. Not because NestJS is better, NestJS is aiming for a different audience. NestJS is built for the node ecosystem and not for the web. And you will say, hey, there are already many libraries in the Node ecosystem. Why should I have another one? So NestJS is not just a framework. It's, I would say, it's the other, li the other li framework, libraries that you call frameworks, they are actual libraries. And Nest tries to solve a more border uh, problem. It takes all these libraries and tries to put them together, together into one framework. So it's not trying to, in to reinvent the wheel. It will use Express as its router, for example, or you could use change it with Fastify. So again, it's not trying to reinvent the wheel. It's just trying to put it in one consistent and uh, layer and try to put other abstraction layers on top of these libraries. For more, few more facts about uh, NestJS. It's written in TypeScript. It's very much inspired by Angular. You will see it everywhere. It's very modular. It gives you tools to build, mod build modular application. It's lib agnostic in terms of, you, I mean, you can change your router. If you like to use Express, you can use Express. You can use Fastify if you want to use Fastify. Or if you like to use other libraries, you can do it as well. And it has a built-in dependency injection, like the one that you familiar with in Angular. This framework is getting more and more popularity. It started at early 2017, and since then you can see the trend line. It's getting higher and higher. It has more than 100,000 downloads a week. It has more than 20,000 uh, stars on GitHub. So it's pretty popular. It's being used by many companies in production. So you should feel comfortable using it in your applications as well. So every Nest application consists from three main building blocks. The first one would be the module. The module is, a, is your domain. You can split your application to domains. And each module has controllers and services. Controllers are the place where you put your routes, your endpoints, and their services will hold your business logic. And from them, you can build your application. So what we will build today, we'll do a lot of uh, live coding. I hope it will go well. And we will create three endpoints. The first one would be to create a user. The second one would be to create an, a registration, I mean, sorry, a create a token or login with the user. And the last one would be to retrieve the created user with its ID. And this endpoint should, be, uh, should check if the user is authenticated. It would be available only for authenticated users. So let's do some uh, live coding. So in order to start uh, a NestJS application, we need to install the uh, NestJS CLI or to use NGX if you don't like to install things globally on your computer. And then use the Nest new command, just as you use in uh, Angular, and create your project. So I have already created a project here. I hope you can see it. We will go quickly on the scaffolding. So you will see a bunch of files here that you have in almost every node application, the package JSON, the package log, uh, J, uh, JSON file, some TypeScript files, and some NestJS CLI files. But we would, would like to, con to concentrate on the SRC folder, which holds four files uh, when you bootstrap the application. And the first one would be the main TS file. The main TS file is your entry point to the application, and it, this file is the one that bootstraps your application. So nothing fancy here. We see that NestJS creates the application, the service from the app module, and it will run it on port 3000. <clears throat> so let's go to our module file. The module file 
is just a simple class which is decorated with the module decorator which is coming from the NSJS common uh, library. The module decorator holds an object which has three parameters, import controllers and providers. Import are the dependencies of this module on other modules. Currently it is empty. It already has one controller, the app controller, and it has one service under the providers. Let's see what we have in the controller. We go to the app controller. Again, a simple class which is decorated with the controller decorator which has come from the Nest library. We see that in the constructor we are injecting the app service and later we use it in the get hello method which is also decorated by the get decorator which indicates that this method should be accessed with a get request, a restful get request. In it we call the get hello method of the app service and let's check what it does. The app service class is decorated with the injectable decorator and it has a one method in it which named get hello and it returns a get hello string. So in order to start the application, we have already predefined script which comes with this library out of the box which is called star dev. Let's run it. It will take a second for the application to boot. And I have an error. Okay, the port is being used. So let's stop it, stop it, stop it, and rerun it. Okay, so the application started. Let's go to port 3000. And we see hello world printed out here in small. Let's try to change this to something else. Uh, let's go to our service and change, remove some exclamation marks here. We will save. And you can see that the, this command, the serve dev command, it looks for changes in your code. It immediately recompiles your application and restarts it. So if I will go back to the browser and I refresh it, it's happened here. We see that it was changed. Great. So as I said, we will create a few endpoints here. And for doing that, we will also use some post requests, things that I cannot do through the URL. I would like to use some tool that will help me to trigger these endpoints. For that, I could use Postman, but I decided to go with Swagger. Uh, for those who don't know what is Swagger, Swagger is a library that helps you to uh, create documentation for your APIs. So in order to, to use it, we will need to install it. I already have it installed in my application. We need to install two libraries, Swagger UI Express and NestJS Swagger. NestJS Swagger is just gives you another layer of abstraction in order to implement, implement this library into your NestJS application. Oops. So let's go to my main file and we want to introduce NestJS, uh, sorry, Swagger to our NestJS application. So let's generate some code here. Swagger. Let's import all the types here. Okay, so what we have in the setup swagger method, we're only doing some setup for our swagger, the title, the description, and the main part is that we are telling it to run on, on pass internal slash API, and for our bootstrap method, we will call the setup swagger function, we will provide it the app, we will save it, and now again, the code is recompiled and restarted. Let's go back to our browser, browser, go to slash internal API, and we have the documentation for our service ready. The nice thing that we already have here, the first method that we saw, the get hello, and we can try to use it here and see if it's working. I will try to zoom here so we can see it works. Great. So, now let's build our first endpoint, which is the create user. So we want to create a user, but we need to store it somewhere. For that, I, I'm using uh, my SQL database. I have it running on my local Docker. Uh, you can see oh, SQL Pro is here. So I'm using the SQL Pro UI just to see what I have in my database. So you can see it has one schema, and there are no tables currently in it. And we will create one soon. I just I will change the order of the windows here. Great. Okay, so, so I have my database, but I need some way to connect to it and to communicate with it. So for that, I will use another three libraries. The first, the first one would be MySQL. It's just the connector to the, to the, to the database. Uh, I will use TypeORM, 
For those who don't know what is ORM, it's just a design pattern in which you are mapping your classes to objects, to tables in your database. And type ORM is just a library written in TypeScript and it uh, works in the Node ecosystem. So I will use that. And again, Nest.js provides you with a wrapper for it in order for you to be able to integrate it smoothly into your application. So let's create our first, first module. I will call it the database module. So we'll create a directory, modules, modules, and I will call it database. In it, I will create a TypeScript file, and I would say it would be a database module. And I will generate some code here. Okay. So what I have here, I have another module called database module. <coughs> Zoom a little bit. It's the same module that we saw in the as the app module, but it has some configuration for the type ORM module. So, so the first few lines here are just the information for the, uh, for the module to connect to the database. We have here logging set to true, just to see some queries that are running behind the scenes. We have the synchronize flag to turn on. I will talk about this flag a little bit later. And under the entities, I will put all my entities. Basically, it will be one entity, the user entity that I will create. It will represent the user that, I will, that will be also created in the database. OK, so let's introduce this uh, uh, module to our main module. So I will go to app module, and I will say database module, and I will save. And I see here in the, in the console that already one query was, uh, was running. Um, this, is, this is a good indication that we were able to connect to the database successfully. Let's try to break stuff. And let's change the password from, or the username from root to root. And save, and I expect to see an error here. So yeah, there's an error. I'm unable to connect to the database. So I'll revert it. So as I said, we use type ORM, but we also will, will, we also will need to use uh, entities. And the first entity that I will create, and the only one that I will create, is the user entity. So I'll create it under the DB module. I will call it the user entity. I will put it under the entities directory. And again, I will generate some code. And is the user entity. So this is, again, a simple class, which is decorated with the entity decorator. The entity decorator coming from the type ORM library. And it has three fields in it, or three columns, if you like. The ID column, the email, and the password. The ID is the identifier. It's an auto-increment uh, column. Email notifies that it's a unique field and a password. Still nothing happens. And things will immediately happen when I will add this entity to, uh, to my uh, type ORM module. I will declare it here, user. And I will save. And I immediately see that there are much more stuff in my console coming from the database. So what's going on here behind the scenes? Because of the synchronized flag, type ORM looking, look, is looking for the entities and looking into the database and try to see differences. When it detects a difference, it updates the database to be aligned to the entities that we have in our code. So if I will go back to the uh, GUI of my, my SQL, I will refresh it, and I see the table I just defined in my uh, type ORM. So it, you can see it has three columns in it, the ID, the user, and the email. The next class that I want to build is uh, the repository. For those of you who don't know what is a repository, it's a design pattern in which you are accessing your entities through this layer of repository, like a layer of abstraction on top of your entities. So I will create uh, the user repository under the repositories directory. Repository is user repository. Now save. Again, I will generate it. User repo. And you can see it's a class, a user repository. It extends from the repository base class, which is coming from the type ORM. The repository class has in it alre already some defined functions that we'll use later in this talk. 
uh, and any additional functions that we will, wa we will want to add, we will add to this class. In order to be able to use this repository, we need to add it to our uh, type or model under the for features method. So let's add it here. And now we can use it. So till this point, what we did, we just configured our database layer, the entities, the repositories, but we didn't do anything about the controller and our API. So let's create another directory here. We'll call it main. And under it, I will create my first user controller. So under controllers, I will use, I will create my user.controller. And let's generate it again. Oh, God. Uh, user controller, here it is. OK. So this is the user controller. We see that this class is annotated with the controller decorator. And we say that every path, every route in this class will be prefixed with the user's string. So currently, we have an empty constructor. And let's start with the first method that we want to write, which would be a post. Uh, call and we'll say create user and we'll provide it a body and we'll say user to create and its type would be any for now we'll change it soon and as a response I would like to have a promise of the created ID which would be a number okay let's handle this any now I don't like to use any in my code. And I would like to express what I will have here. So under the same director, I will create a user DTO file. The user DTO is a, oh, not this one, a user DTO, there it is. So the user DTO has, is a class. It has two fields, the email and the password. You can see that I'm decorating the fields with the API model property. This will help our Swagger to understand better the objects that we try to pass and will give us the relevant documentation. So now we can go to the controller and say, instead of any, to say that we use here the create user DTO. Now let's go quickly and create our user service because we want to have all the logic to be on our logic layer. And this is done by the services. So let's create a directory called services. And in it, we will create a class named user service, user.service. And let's write this one down. Export class user service. Every service should be decorated with the injectable decorator. And that's it for now. Going back to our controller, what we want to use to do now is to create our user. And we do it, first of all, we'll inject, of course, the service here. User service of type user service. Here it is. And now we can use it here. User service, create user. We will provide it the email, and we'll provide it the password. This would be an, yeah, I will create it in a minute. So this method will be an asynchronous method, so I will, I will put await before it. And now let's create, create this method in our uh, user service. I will have a typo here. I will change it to create, create. Okay. So in order to use our repository, I need to inject it here. So I will write a constructor here, constructor. And I will inject it, the repositories that we created in the DB module, user repository. And now I can create a user entity, user. I will need to import it. And I will append to it the fields that I, were, I was asked to. So it said the email 
is the, the provided email, and the password is the provided password. And now I will use my repository. As I said, everything that we want to do with the entities, we need to use uh, repositories. So use a repository, and we call a built-in method called save, and we will provide it with the user. And let's return, return it here. And also let's say that what we are returning here is a promise of a user. Oh, yeah, I'm, too, I'm too excited, sorry. So I'll put it in the right place. Thanks for that. OK, let's, now let's go back to our, to our uh, controller. Let's return here the ID of the created user. It's lint here. OK, so we have no, don't have any errors now, but we still didn't add the controller to our module. And this is why we won't see anything in our swagger. So let's go to our main module, app module, and add our user controller under controllers. User controller. So let's save it. Hopefully, there won't be any errors. But we see an error here. Says, says, says tells me that he doesn't know how to in, in, in initialize user controller because he doesn't know what is its first argument that we try to inject into it. So we, we can see that we are providing here the user service, but we didn't add it to our app module. So we'll need to add it here as well. So let add our user service here and save. And now we have no errors here. Let's refresh Swagger, and we see the new endpoint that we created, and let's try it out. So we see that Swagger tells me some properties about the object that I need to pass. We have an email and a, and a password, so let's Try to put some password here, and a very secured password. And let's try it out. And in the response, I can see that I have an ID. Now I expect it to be persistent in my database. So let's go to my database. It's very small, sorry, but you can see we have one row of data. Great. So we're almost done with this endpoint, but let's try to push our limits. And let's remove the add sign. So of course, this is not valid email, oh, sorry. This is the second example that I want to show you. Let's create, try to create the same user with the same email. If you remember, the, user the email field is a uh, unique, unique one. So we expect to have an exception. So let's try to execute. And what we see here, we see an error with status code 500, an internal server error. Something bad happened. If I will go to my console, I immediately see that this, we have a duplicated entry with the same email. So we are safe in terms of that users won't be able to provide us unsafe data, but the error is bad. Probably we want to give our users a different error. It's not a server error. We want to handle this type of errors and be more informative to our users. So how we do that? We'll go to our user service. Actually, we'll go to our repository, and we'll create a method. Let's look for users with a provided email. So let's generate this method. What's going on? Oh, here it is. So here I'm using the TypeORM API to create a query programmatically, not with the SQL. Basically what it does is just you provide it with an email and it looks for users with the same email and returns it. Uh, nothing sp fancy here. And now in my create user uh, method in my service, I will try to check before creating the user if the user already exists. So I'll say await this user repository, find user by email, I will provide it the email, and if the user already exists, I will need to make the function async. Let's throw an exception. Throw new HTTP exception. HTTP exception, I would say email already in use, and the status code would be conflict. Let's try to save it. No errors. Let's go back to my swagger here. 
And let's not change anything here. We saw that in the previous example that it failed because an internal server error. And what will happen now is that we have a different status cause with much more informative uh, error. And this was done relatively easy. If you have some experience with Node application, it's not that trivial to do that in your application out of the box. NestJS gives you this type of functionality out of the box. OK. So now let's try to go to the first example that I tried to show you and try to give some invalid input here. So this is, of course, not a valid email. I removed the at sign. But if I will try to execute the method, I see that the user was created. And if I go to my database and refresh it, I see that this user with an VV email was created. This is not good. So what NestJS can provide me in order to avoid this type of errors? It has a feature called pipes. In order to use it, we need to install some libraries. We need to uh, install the class validators and class transformers library. And to tell NestJS for every, for every call to transform the object that it gets and validate it. And this is done by an API called use global, uh, global pipes. And we call a new validation pipe. But this is not enough. We need to say what are our restrictions. Sorry. So we'll go to our uh, controller, Oops, sorry, controller, and to our DTO. And we say, hey, this email field is not just a field. It's an email field. And I can decorate it with the is email decorator and save. And again, I don't need to do any changes in my swagger, so I don't need to refresh it. I will just try to use the same method again, execute. And I now see a different, totally different error, 400. And it says the email must be an email. This is probably not so informative error again. And we can, of course, change it. And we will say here the message would be invalid email. So I'll go back to my swagger, execute the call again. And I see the message is the one that I just wrote. So this is it for the first endpoint. <laughs> Great. Now let's do our second endpoint, which will be to create a token. So what we will do here, the way that we want to authenticate the user, for user will provide us the credentials, its email, his email and password. And if, we, if it's a valid credentials, we will set a cookie on the, on the response, which will indicate that this user is authenticated. So going back to my controller, I will create another post method. I will say that it would be under the token or yeah, token path. I will say create token. Again, this method will expect a body, which I would say the credentials. I will set it as any for now. And I will ask NestJS to provide me here also the response object. And this is done by the REST decorator. Because NestJS is coming by default with express, so the response object would be express response object. So here it is, response, we can say express. And we will return here a promise of void. So we don't have any logic here yet. We need to first validate that the user provides us with the correct credentials. So let's define our create credentials object. So let's create this DTO file, credentials, DTO, DTO. Again, let's generate it. Credentials DTO. It has two fields, email and the password. And let's use it in our controller. So the service will return us a token. This user service, get token, token. We will provide it the credentials. From the credentials, we'll provide the email, and we'll provide it the password. And we again, we, we will need to await to a response. So I'll mark this function as async. And then I will use the response 
to add, sorry, to add the cookie on it. I will call the cookie just token. And I said, I will set the token here. And because I injected the response here, I will also need to let, J let NestJS to know that the response is ready, so I'll call send. Now let's create the get token method in our service. So here it is. I will return a promise of a number. The number will be just the ID of the, of the user. Not a safe way to create tokens, but it will do for the demo. And I will use the find user by email method that I already created in order to find the user that was provided for me. So here is the user. I will await for the response. OK, I already have it. And now we'll check if we don't have the user or the user password is not equal to the provided password, I would like to throw an exception. So I will copy the exception that I have from the first method that we created. I would say wrong credentials. Credentials. And I would say that this is forbidden. Forbidden. Great. If everything goes well and there is no, uh, no error and the user is validated, let's return its ID. And that's it. Let's go to our Swagger and hope that everything will work. So we have the new, the new method uh, post user tokens. I, let's remove this one from here. Let's try it out. So our first user that we created was v at v.com. And its, email, its password was 1234. Let's try to execute. And we see that, I hope you can see it, that the, the, the cookie was added to our, uh, to our response. Great. So the user is now has a token, and it is authenticated. And now let's move on to our third and last API. Again, this API will retrieve us a user by you will provide it an ID, and we will return some information about the user. But this endpoint is only available for authenticated users. Authenticated users are users with the tokens that we just created. Going back to our controller, we'll create now a get method. And we will say that it receives one parameter. In its pass, it will be a user ID. And we said get user by ID. And it is a param, not like object, uh, like, not like bodies that we used in our previous methods. This is a param. We say that it's mapped to user ID. So we say user ID, and its type is a number. And what we will return, we will return a promise, which will hold an object which has, which has the ID of the user, which is a number, and its email, which is a string. Now let's call our, again, let's create const user. Let's call our service, user service, get user, get user by ID. Let's provide it the ID. Let's, we, need, we will need to await for it, again, because this is an asynchronous code. And we will return an object which holds the ID, the user.id. And the user email, user dot email. Again, we didn't create the get user method method in our service, so let's generate it. It will return us a promise of a user, a user, and this is simple because we have this method already built in in our repository, uh, the one that we are extending from. So this dot user repository find one, and we will need to provide it the user ID. So here it is. And that's all. Our method is ready. Everything should, should work now. Let's refresh our service. Our swagger, sorry. Try it out. Let's put the first ID. And it's working, hopefully. Yeah, it's working. 
But the problem here is that we didn't do anything with the authentication, right? We're just trying to retrieve the user and it's returned. But if I were to use remove the cookie, it will also work. And I don't want this type of situation to happen. So for that, Nest.js has a nice feature called guards. So I will create a class named authguard. Dot guard. It's the first one, yeah. This is the auth guard. The auth guard has to implement the can activate interface, and it has a one method that you must to implement, which is the can activate. It receives a context, and from the context you can derive the request. And in the request, we look for the cookie, and we check if the cookie exists. Again, this is not a good example for a secured application, just to demonstrate guards. In order to read the cookie, we will need to add something else. Again, if you're familiar with Node, in order to read cookies, you need to have a lib called uh, cookie parser. And we need to add it to our main entry file, app use cookie parser. And that's it. So now every call that we will, will be called, the, the request will be, uh, the cookie will be go through this uh, middleware, and now we can use them in, later in our application. So now let's go back to our controller, and we now need to decorate the method that we have here with the auth guard. So we will say use guards. You can provide multiple guards here, but we have only one, the auth guard. Let's save it. And let's try now the endpoint, this endpoint again. We can see that we don't have the token here anymore. So I'm expecting that the application will fail. So we can see we're getting an error that the user is forbidden to access uh, our application. Let's try to see if it works when we are authenticated. So we will use the token, try it out. Again, I will put this vb.com and my password. So the, the cookie was added, and now let's try to use the get user by ID endpoint, and we have the data. So, yeah, this one is how to install the cookie parser. And let's do a short summary to the things that we covered here and what we didn't cover. So, we talked about modules and we talked about controller services, guards, and type ORM. We talked a little bit about Swagger, but there is much more stuff that, didn't, that we didn't talk about. We didn't talk about middlewares and GraphQL, custom decorators, and many, many more features of this framework. I really encourage you to read the documentation. The documentation is a very good source of learning this library. There's already a lot of community around this uh, library. Uh, so in, you are in a safe zone. And uh, that's it. So if you have any questions.